The last step in destructing a belief and culture is to insult it so that people despise it from then on, preventing it from ever being restored. The CCP considered the traditions of the Hui Muslim group to be one of the four olds, old thought, culture, tradition, and habit. Therefore, it forced the Hui people to eat pork. Muslim peasants and mosques were required to raise pigs, and each household had to furnish two pigs to the country every year. The Red Guards even forced the second highest living Tibetan Buddha, the Panchen Lama, to eat human excrement. They ordered three monks from the Temple of Bliss, located in Harbin City, Heilongjiang Province, which is the biggest Buddhist temple built in modern times, to hold a poster board that said, The hell with sutras, they are full of shit. In 1971, the CCP started a frantic movement to criticize Confucius, an author who wrote under the pen name Liang Xiao, published an article in The Red Flag, the CCP's foremost magazine, entitled, Who is Confucius? The article described Confucius as a madman who wanted to turn history backward and a deceptive and shrewd demagogue. A series of cartoons and songs followed, demonizing Confucius. In this way, the dignity and sacredness of religion and culture were annihilated. The characters of the written Chinese language embody the essence of 5,000 years of civilization. Each character's form and pronunciation and the idioms and literary allusions composed of combinations of the characters express profound cultural meanings. The CCP has not only simplified the Chinese characters, but also tried to replace them with Romanized pinyin which would remove all cultural tradition from the Chinese characters and language. But the replacement plan failed, thus sparing further damage to the Chinese language. However, the intellectuals who inherited the same traditional culture were not so fortunate as to be spared destruction. Before the CCP gained power in 1949, China had about two million intellectuals. Although some had studied in Western countries, they still inherited some Confucian ideas. The CCP certainly could not relax its control of them because, as members of the traditional scholar aristocracy class, their ways of thinking played important roles in shaping the thoughts of ordinary people. In September 1951, the CCP initiated a broad thought reform movement, starting in Beijing University among the intellectuals. The intellectuals were required to organize a movement to confess their history, including their thoughts, faithfully and honestly, in attempts to cleanse any counter-revolutionary elements. Mao Zedong never liked intellectuals. He said that they ought to be aware of the truth that actually many so-called intellectuals are, relatively speaking, quite ignorant, and that the workers and farmers sometimes know more than they do. Mao also said, compared with the workers and peasants, to the CCP, the intellectuals are dirty, and in the last analysis, the workers and peasants are the cleanest people, even though their hands are covered with dirt and their feet are smeared with cow dung. The CCP's persecution of intellectuals started with various forms of accusations, ranging from the 1951 criticism of Wu Shun, or running schools with begged money, to Mao Zedong's personal attack in 1955 on writer Hu Feng, a scholar and literary critic, as a counter-revolutionary. In the beginning, the intellectuals were not categorized as a reactionary class, but by 1957, after several major religious groups had surrendered through the Unified Front Movement, the CCP could focus its energy on the intellectuals now. The anti-rightist movement then was launched. At the end of February 1957, 
claiming to let a hundred flowers bloom and a hundred schools of thought contend. The CCP called on intellectuals to voice their suggestions and criticisms of the party, promising no retaliation. These intellectuals had been dissatisfied with the CCP for a long time, for its ruling in every field, even though it was a layman in those fields, and its killing of innocent people during the movement to suppress counter-revolutionaries in 1950-1953, and the movement to eliminate counter-revolutionaries in 1955-1957. They thought that the CCP had finally become open-minded, so they began to speak their true feelings, and their criticism grew more and more intense. Many years later, there are still many people who believe that Mao Zedong only started to attack the intellectuals after becoming impatient with their overly harsh criticisms. The truth, however, turned out to be different. On May 15, 1957, Mao Zedong wrote an article entitled, Things Are Beginning to Change, and circulated it among senior CCP officials. The article said, In recent days, the rightists have shown themselves to be most determined and most rabid. The rightists, who are anti-communist, are making a desperate attempt to stir up a typhoon above Force 7 in China, and are so bent on destroying the Communist Party. After that, the officials who had been indifferent to the Let a Hundred Flowers Bloom and a Hundred Schools of Thought Contend campaign suddenly became enthusiastic and earnest. In her memoir, The Past Doesn't Disappear Like Smoke, Zheng Bojun's daughter recounted the following. Li Wei Han, minister of the United Front Work Department, called Zheng Bojun in person to invite him to a so-called rectification meeting to offer his opinion about the CCP. Zhang was arranged to sit on a front row sofa. Not knowing this to be a trap, Zhang articulated his criticisms of the CCP. During the whole course, Li Wei Han appeared relaxed. Zhang probably thought Li agreed with what he said. What he didn't know was that Li was pleased because he saw his prey falling into the trap. After the meeting, Zhang was classified as the number one rightist in China. We can cite a string of dates that marked proposals or speeches delivered by intellectuals offering criticism and suggestions. Zhang Bojun's Political Design Institute on May 21st, Long Yun's Absurd Anti-Soviet Views on May 22nd, Luo Longji's Redressing Committee on May 22nd, Lin Shiling's speech on criticizing the CCP's feudalistic socialism at Beijing University on May 30th, Wu Zhu Guang's the party should stop leading the arts on May 31st, and Chu Anping's The Party Dominates the World on June 1st. All these proposals and speeches had been invited and were offered after Mao Zedong had already sharpened his butcher's knife. All of these intellectuals, predictably, were later labeled rightists. There were more than 550,000 of them nationwide. <laughs> Chinese tradition has it that scholars can be killed but cannot be humiliated. The CCP, however, was capable of humiliating intellectuals, depriving their right to make a living, and even incriminating their families unless they accepted humiliation. Many intellectuals did surrender. During the course, some of them turned in others to save themselves, which broke many people's hearts. Those who did not submit to humiliation were killed, serving as examples to terrorize the others. Thus, the intellectuals, the traditional scholarly class, the exemplars of social morality, were obliterated. Mao Zedong said, What can Emperor Qin Shi Huang brag about? He only killed 460 Confucian scholars, but we killed 46,000 intellectuals. In our suppression of counter-revolutionaries, didn't we kill some counter-revolutionary intellectuals as well? I argued with the pro-democratic people who accused us of acting like Emperor Qin Shi Huang. I said they were wrong. We surpassed him by a hundred times. Indeed, Mao did more than kill the intellectuals. Even worse, he destroyed their minds and hearts.
While the CCP was destroying the traditional semi-divine culture of China, it quietly established its own party culture through continuous political movements. As one of the CCP's classic documents, Mao's speech at the Yan'an Forum on Literature and the Arts named cultural endeavors and the military as the two battlefronts. It stated that it was not enough to have just the armed military, an army of literary arts was also needed. It stipulated that the literary arts should serve politics, and the literary arts of the proletariat class are the gears and screws of the revolutionary machine. A complete system of party culture was developed out of this, with supporting the CCP the ultimate goal, and with atheism and class struggle at the core. This system goes completely against traditional culture and penetrates every aspect of people's life. It formed an environment of terror and despotism for the party, so that the possessing evil specter could control people even more tightly.